All right, welcome to our last lecture of the semester. I hope you've been studying really hard, memorizing all the diseases and their characteristic um, symptoms, route of transmission, and if we discussed any um, treatment and prevention options, right? So we are going to talk about helmets, and then very briefly, we're going to review vectors, uh, which um, is most, it's mostly just review and it's just two slides. Um, so for the helmets, list the distinguishing characteristics of parasitic helmets, provide a rationale for the elaborate life cycles of parasitic worms, list the characteristics of the two classes of parasitic platy helmets, and give an example of each list the characteristics of parasitic nematodes and give an example of infective eggs and infective larvae, compare and contrast platy helmets and nematodes. Describe a par parasitic infection for each of the following, humans as the definitive host, humans as the intermediate host. And uh, so make sure you understand what definitive host is. And when you see that, um, and contrast that to humans as an intermediate host. And also we will see um, humans as a dead end host, meaning that they the there's no spread after that. Like the hu human is infected, but does not uh, spread infection to any other um, host. That would be a dead end host. Um, and then for each of the diseases that we discuss, what is the classification? What's the mode of transmission? What are the disease symptoms? Okay. All right, so helminths are parasitic worms. A number of parasitic animals spend part or some of them, their entire life cycle will be um, inside of humans. We're not looking at helminths um, in their full, um, manner, we're only looking at the parasitic and, and we're only looking at a few examples. There are more parasitic um, helmets out there. Um, platy helmets, platy means flat. Okay, so platy helmet, these are the flatworms. Flatworms are going to be flukes and tapeworms. And the flukes are called trematodes and the tapeworms are called cestodes. So we are in the kingdom animalia and then we're in the phylum platyhelminthes and the class would be either trematodes or cestodes okay so that's the classification uh, we will also look at the phylum nematoda which are round worms and those will include things like hookworms and whoop and whipworms and pinworms so you'll see pinworm you'll see um, ascaris which is it's just a roundworm. It's it's not specialized as a hookworm, pinworm, or whipworm. Um, but yes, we will see uh, ascaris. We'll see pinworms. We'll see whipworms, um, and we'll see uh, hookworms um, at the end. Okay, so there are many more worms, um, free living, and and other animals, but we will only be focusing on. Um, Human, human parasites, okay? Okay, so again, we're in the kingdom Animalia. Uh, these animals, these worms are uh, chemoheterotrophs and they are all multicellular. So now we're going to see tissues and organs. We're going to see things like digestive systems and uh, reproductive systems. We're not going to investigate nervous systems and circulatory systems, but they are present. Um, some worms uh, will ingest and others will absorb, it depends on the worm. And typically they have pretty elaborate life cycles with uh, multiple hosts. And so we will take a look at, at some of those. So we have some terminology, monaceous or hermaphroditic. Um, meaning that you can find both the male and the female reproductive system 
in one animal. Uh, dioecious means separate male and female worms. And so we'll see examples of, of each. Um, and then typically the uh, developmental, um, overall in general, the development will be from an egg to a larvae and then to an adult worm. But what you'll see is that some of these have multiple types of eggs or larvae before they um, get to the adult form. So keep that in mind. Um, the term definitive host, you probably remember from previous lectures, is an organism which supports the adult or sexual reproduction form of a parasite. Okay, so definitive host means that you find the sexual reproduction of the parasite in that host. Okay, helminths, platy helminths, flatworms. Okay, we're going to start with uh, flukes. We're going to see lung fluke, um, liver fluke, and a blood fluke. Okay, and then we will go and talk about tapeworms. We're going to see uh, three tapeworms, but really you can think of it as two. Um, so we'll, we'll look at um, this intestinal worm where the dog is the definitive host, but it can infect people. And, uh, and then we'll look at beef tapeworm and pork tapeworm, uh, which are the same genus, but different species. So if you remember the, uh, Tinea, uh, tinea, sorry, tinea, tinea um, is the genus name uh, for beef and pork tapeworms. And then you just remember that the beef is uh, saginata and uh, pork is solium. Okay. All right. So the flukes have a what we call like leaf like shape to their body where it's tapered um, at one end. And um, so they have this outer covering called a cuticle. It's not living, it's like dead, um, kind of like the outer layer of our skin or like our fingernails, right, are dead. Um, so non-living cover of the fluke and it's also where uh, food absorption takes place. So flukes absorb their food, okay? Um, they have this leaf-like body shape and they usually have a sucker um, at the, the ventral sucker and the oral sucker. So here's the oral sucker. And on here, we don't, they have not shown us the ventral sucker, but it would typically be somewhere um, uh, anywhere from, from here to, to the end uh, is where you can see it. So here you can see um, in this example, you see the oral sucker and then the ventral sucker kind of um, in the middle. Sometimes it can be even lower. Um, and the other thing to notice is that there are um, both testes and ovaries. Right, and so here we see here the ovaries and uh, the testes. So both reproductive systems. Um, there's a larval form um, and I think that's it for the terminology for now. I'm not going to I'm not going to show you an image and ask you to label it. That's what we would have done in lab, um, but this semester's you know different. Okay, so uh, memorize the concepts, but I'm not asking you to memorize these images. Okay. Okay, so the lung fluke. Um, now, there are others, this isn't the only one, but this is uh, an example of a lung fluke, uh, paragon, uh, paragonimus. There are different species, but they will typically cause the same um, disease and have a similar um, life cycle. So in the US, 
people typically become infected by eating raw crayfish. It's pretty common if people are doing um, like river rafting. Um, not so much in, I don't think it's too common in California, but uh, it still does occur uh, in the US. And the adult flu does live in us. So the human is the definitive host, right? And you see that here, definitive host is a human, okay? Um, these flukes can be about six millimeters wide and 12 millimeters long. Um, so that's big enough for you to see, right, with, with the naked eye. Um, but it doesn't start out that big. It starts out as um, like a cyst that you cannot see. Um, it's very small. Um, and it would be in the, the food that you, that you eat. Um, and so you don't see it, excuse me. And there's kind of an elaborate, uh, way that it, uh, interacts in the body. So the human ingests the, um, what we call meta, um, circaria, and the metasaccharia, which is the, the cyst, um, or an egg, right? Um, it's going to first go into your digestive system, right? And then it's going to travel to the lung. And then th the lung is where it will grow into the adult form and then the adult will shed or release eggs. And the eggs will be coughed up in the sputum, but then they will be swallowed and released in the feces. So a very um, a kind of bizarre relationship of the um, intestines and the lungs, which we see actually with the worms, we see this a lot. So you will see this um, coughing up sputum, swallowing it, and then shedding um, the eggs and the feces. You'll see that for several of the diseases we're going to look at today. Okay, um, the eggs in, for for paragonimus, the eggs have to reach the water in order for the life cycle to continue. Okay, and so the eggs. Um, after you've uh, swallowed the sputum, the eggs can be shed in the feces, and then you get another life form, which notice is now ciliated, and then that will um, invade a snail, um, and you'll get the asexual life cycle in the snail, and then the snail will release um, cercaria, and the cercaria will uh, go to an intermediate host, the crayfish, right? Um, where you will then get um, the cercaria will insist or be become cysts uh, to produce the, the next phase of the life cycle called the metasaccharia. And then the metasaccharia is what you ingest when you eat these um, crayfish, um, and, and then that's the cycle. Okay. So I'm not going to, um, test you on this, uh, phase of the life cycle. I'm not going to test you on, on this detail here, but you do need to know that the uh, definitive host is the human they ingest infected crayfish. The crayfish have metasaccharia, okay? So you ingest the metasaccharia. Um, it travels to the lung, right? Um, and then the adult fluke releases eggs. And, uh, and then the eggs are um, in the sputum, which gets swallowed and then released into the feces. And then the eggs must reach water in order to 
then um, infect the snail, and then and then the crayfish. Okay, and the snail is where the asexual life cycle happens, and then the intermediate host um, is where the actual infectious stage will be released. So you do need to know snail and crayfish, right? Um, so the snail is infected from the humans that release eggs in the feces, and then the crayfish is infected from the snail that's releasing the cercaria. Okay, and then the crayfish is releasing the metasaccharia or has the metasaccharia in it rather. Um, and then that's what you ingest. Okay. Okay, now the Asian liver fluke, sometimes called Chinese liver fluke, sometimes called Oriental liver fluke, um, is when it when it appears in the United States, um, it's from people who have traveled and it does not, um, it's not going to lead to an outbreak because we don't have the, um, we don't have the snail that's required for the life cycle. Okay. Um, so, but it's something to keep in mind if you're traveling or if you uh, are treating patients who have traveled, right? So how does it happen? People ingest, um, just like in, in with the other fluke, we saw people ingest the metastacariae uh, or the cysts um, in raw or undercooked freshwater fish like uh, crayfish, crabs, right? Or actual freshwater fish. So that part is uh, the same. And there's the intermediate host uh, with the snail. So very, very similar life cycle. Um, here we see that, uh, so you ingest the metasaccharae and um, those are cysts that are in the freshwater fish, crab or crayfish. Okay, you ingest it and then it, the eggs from the cysts are released in the duodenum of the small intestine which is kind of hard to see in this image. Um, and then uh, it can travel to the uh, gallbladder, the bile duct, or the liver. Um, and so that's kind of what we're seeing here. The second um, line is pointing to like the liver and the bile duct. Um, and the gallbladder, which are all kind of, you know, in the same little spot um, as the bile duct connects from the liver to the gallbladder. You, you remember your anatomy. Um, and then the duodenum is the very first part of the small intestine um, as contents exit the stomach. So we have the um, adult worms are, are there and they can grow to be pretty long, 10 to 25 millimeters in length. Um, and so they're going to release um, embryonated eggs, which are infectious, and that the eggs will then be ingested by the snail, the intermediate host, right? And then you're going to have all these different phases occur um, in the intermediate host, and I'm not going to test you on, on, on those, but just that uh, the embryonated egg passed in human feces, which has to get to the water, and then that's going to in, uh, infect the snail, and then the snail is going to release this free swimming um, cercariae um, cyst, okay? And then that is going to infect the freshwater fish, crab or crayfish, and develop into metasaccharia, which then you ingest, okay? And then repeat. But this does not happen in the United States because we don't have the snail, the type of snail that's required for this life cycle. And then there's the blood fluke, uh, schizosmosis. Uh, is caused by schizosoma, okay? Certain freshwater snails are infected with the parasite. 
The snail releases free swimming circarciae. Remember, circarciae are um, larvae and they penetrate the skin of the human. When they, when they penetrate the skin of the human, they will lose or shed their tail and then they will travel through the blood. Um, they'll mature in the intestinal blood vessels and then the adult will migrate to the bowel and the bladder to produce and shed eggs. And then those eggs will be released in both urine and feces. So this is unique. We, it's the only example we have of uh, the worm going to the bladder. So the only time that the eggs are being released in urine. Um, so I know there's a lot of similarities uh, with snails <laughs> um, uh, that we've seen so far. So do your best to uh, really remember for each of these flukes, um, the life cycle, okay? Um, and then the eggs will hatch, release free swimming larvae and infect uh, snails. So uh, one type of larvae infects the snail and then a different type of larvae is released from the snail. And you need to remember that the intermediate host is the snail and uh, it releases the circaria. The circaria is the free swimming, um, it's the free swimming uh, larvae that will directly penetrate the skin of the human, okay? And then it sheds its tail. So it's just this region that will remain and that will travel through the blood. It will develop into the adult fluke and it will shed eggs both in the rectum and in the bladder, okay? And this image here is showing you that, uh, so there's a mouth, there's a, a ventral sucker, and this is considered the male. And then down here you have the female, which has its own mouth. Um, and so this is showing you that this uh, is a male and female um, together. So the female lives in a groove on the ventral or lower surface of the male and is there's continuous fertilization that's occurring. Um, and so continuously uh, laying eggs. Um, and of course the, the sucker is used uh, by the male to attach to the host. Um, approximately 300 million people are infected with schizosoma and it does lead to um, around 200,000 deaths every year. So um, pretty serious. Also, whenever you see uh, that this um, parasite can directly penetrate skin, I, I feel that that's just more disturbing for some reason. <laughs> um, and these people, you know, they can't see the, um, the, the free swimming um, Sarcarcia is very small. And they have to be in the water uh, for their, a lot of them, it's their livelihood. Um, and, and then others, it's the only way that they can wash um, clothing and even maybe bathing themselves. So um, it's not an option for them to just avoid the water. So this is going to continue until we can come up with um, a realistic way to treat or prevent. Um, but it's, like I said, it's not going to be a simple problem to solve because you cannot just tell pe these people who depend on the water, um, you can't tell them to stay out of the water. Okay, so uh, this is, this disease is probably going to continue to become more, more and more problematic until we can um, figure out a, a, an actual solution. Um, so this is not going to, you're not going to see this in the United States either. Okay, now we're going to look at tapeworms. So we're still in the phylum platyhelminths and we're now switching the class to cestodes, the tapeworms. Okay, um, tapeworms have like a head, which we call the scolex. This, that's going to contain like hooks and suckers. Um, and then the rest of the body, which I guess you could think of as the tape, um, has these repeating segments. 
And these segments are called proglottids. And the proglottids uh, contain eggs. And so the tapeworm will continue to produce these um, sections and continue to shed the, uh, the sections. And so you get um, just massive, massive amounts of eggs. Um, you know, each, each proglottid can contain thousands of eggs and then there's thousands of proglottids in this chain, right? Um, so that's a little bit about the tapeworm life cycle. Um, it's a little, little simple, simplified. Um, if you look at one of the proglottids, you'll see that they have the ovaries, they have a, um, they have a what they call a genital pore for um, um, for reproduction. If you want to think of it as sperm um, to come fertilize the ovaries, um, and then there's also a, a little a little sucker. Okay, so the mature proglottid. Uh, has eggs, right? It's been fertilized, it has eggs, and then um, this covering will disintegrate and then the eggs will be released, okay? And I don't know if I specified, but for the um, scolex, um, the head of the cestode, it has the, the hooks and the suckers for attachment to the host. All right, so the adult tapeworm releases eggs, eggs are excreted in feces, Eggs uh, are ingested by either deer, sheep, or humans, and uh, humans can also become infected by contamination uh, from touching the animals, uh, especially like dog feces or saliva. Um, and so this tapeworm that we're talking about is Econococcus granulosus. And Econococcus, um, you'll see for the this formation of these cysts. So what happens is the eggs hatch in the human small intestine, and then the larvae migrate to either the liver or the lungs or both. And then the larvae develop into these special cysts, um, hydatid cysts, and that's what we name the disease after. Um, these uh, cysts, have these special um, capsules which contain thousands of scolices, which are the heads of the worms, which can then each of those can um, attach to a host and, um, and produce proglottids. But humans are not the intended host. Humans are actually dead in host. It's almost, you can think of it as like an accident, right? Humans are not supposed to be the host. So when a, when a human becomes infected, they're not passing the disease on to any other organism. But these other animals, deer, sheep, right? Um, and, and wolves, uh, I'm sorry, the deer, sheep, other wild animals, if they are eaten by a wolf, the um, the cysts, right? The hydad cysts. Uh, if they're eaten by the wolf, then um, those heads, the scolices, will attach to the wolf's intestine and produce proglottids. Uh, but for humans, uh, it's supposed we're supposed to be the dead end host where um, the life cycle stops with us. Um, which I have I have a um, life cycle image we'll look at in a second, but. Um, but the cysts can grow in us. We're not going to pass the disease on to anybody or any animals, but we can be infected and, and suffer consequences. In fact, this is considered the most dangerous of all of the um, parasitic worm infections. Um, these cysts can grow to be enormous when they're um, when they have the space, when they're free to expand, they can continue to expand and hold more and more and more fluid, um, up to 15 liters of fluid in a single cyst. Other cysts, because of their location, are going to cause tissue damage, interfere with the uh, function of the organ, 
and that can have very severe uh, consequences on the person. Think if the cysts are forming in the brain, it's going to impair brain function and that can be fatal um, or have devastating consequences. A bone, uh, painful and debilitating and can lead to all sorts of problems. Um, our bones are not only structural support for our body, but remember all of our blood cells come from our bone marrow. And then of course the, um, the most important risk factor of being infected with these cysts is that they can rupture at any point in a person's life. And the person's immune system can um, be overstimulated and cause anaphylactic shock. And so this is actually as as much as you would be tempted to think that the tissue damage is the, the leading cause of death, it's actually this anaphylactic shock. Um, so the rupturing of the cysts is actually the predominant way that people die from this disease. So on this slide, it seems like it's not so bad because the humans are the dead and host, but it is bad. It's very, very dangerous. Okay. Oh, what happened to my... Okay, so I'm missing my life cycle slide for Econococcus. It is in your textbook and I will, um, I'll add it in and update the slides for you. Maybe it's after here. No, it really is missing. Sorry about that, guys. I, uh, I'm surprised that got by me. Okay, so uh, definitely look at your textbook and I'll also update it and add it to Canvas for you. Please pardon my uh, allergies. <laughs> All right, so the beef tapeworm and the pork tapeworm are both um, tenia, uh, tenia, okay? Um, and we have to be careful not to confuse that with tinea, which is a ringworm, okay? So tinea saginata is the beef tapeworm that adult worms live in humans and can be six meters long. Have you guys have seen a meter stick in classrooms? Oftentimes teachers use them to point to regions on the whiteboard, and then we can also use it to measure things. Uh, so uh, meter stick, very big, right? Um, very long. So I'm now imagine this adult worm being six meters long. That's one of the biggest, um, but definitely the biggest we've seen this far. Um, the Skolox will have thousands of proglottids after it, right? Um, and we already talked about what those are. Those contain eggs. Uh, and they'll continue to be shed uh, for as long as the worm is in the um, intestine. It's going to continue to produce these proglottids and shed them in the feces. Uh, each proglottid contains thousands of eggs. When the proglottids are ingested by cattle, um, then the larvae uh, inside the eggs hatch and they will um, bore or, or burrow through the intestinal wall. Um, and then migrate to mussels. And those mussels will then um, have cystocere. So the uh, larvae migrate to mussel and transform into cysts called cystocere. And when the cystocere are ingested by humans that eat these animals, right, um, then the scolex um, is the only part that will survive and it will attach to the small intestine and then it will start to produce proglottids again, okay? So um, pork, on the other hand, we have kind of two situations, so it's a little different. Um, in the first scenario, humans are the only known definitive host. Adult worms uh, are found in the intestine. They're producing eggs and shedding, so that part's the same. When eggs are eaten by pigs, the larvae insist 
into the series. So, so far, this is exactly the same as beef, uh, just it's pigs instead of cattle. People become infected when they eat the undercooked meat, in this case, pork. And this is the common life cycle, the pig human life cycle that we see in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. But we do not really see this in the United States. However, we see a different form, which is human to human transmission. And so in the United States, we have this uh, different form of the disease, human to human transmission. And this is from ingesting eggs from an infected person. And that's going to lead to the disease called sister cirrhosis. Uh, and this is can be very, very serious uh, because the larvae can insist in the brain. So instead of the larvae insisting in the animal's muscles, it's now doing it to us as a, the human. Um, but it's not limited to muscle anymore. It can go to the brain. It can go to the eyes. It's most commonly known to go to the brain. Um, and then it's called neurosister cirrhosis. Um, it can go to the eyes and be ophthalmic, but that's not quite as common. Um, your textbook shows it, but it's not the predominant. The predominant form is the neuro um, cysts. And um, humans are, in this case, the intermediate host because we're ingesting the eggs um, where the normal pig human life cycle, the adult worms are found in human intestines and producing the eggs. And then the pigs eat the eggs and are insisted with cystoceri. Okay, so uh, we see the life cycle kind of flip. Um, and then we're getting human to human transmission in the United States where um, the eggs are ingested by the person and um, and then cystoceri happen, uh, happen within the human body and it is um, much more dangerous, right? Okay, so here's the tenia life cycle, uh, generalized because it can be beef or pork. Um, they show cattle, beef, and pork, right? Um, and so they're showing in general when humans ingest raw or undercooked infected meat that have these cystoceri, um, they will um, end up having an infection in their small intestine with the adult tapeworm and shed the eggs, the proglottids, right? And then the cattle or pigs come in contact with those um, eggs and ingest it. What this life cycle is missing is this US human to human transmission. So you should make your own sketch, make your own drawing of this life cycle. So this is just showing the top portion. It is not showing the bottom portion. Okay, so don't skip that. All right, now we can move to our roundworms, the nematodes. Okay, these are cylindrical. They're actually visibly round. Um, they also have complete digestive systems with mouth, intestine, and anus. Um, so these are more complex than the tapeworms that we were looking at and the flukes, right? Um, most of these will have separate male and female worms, so dioecious. Um, males are typically smaller than the female and they have a specialized, uh, um, I guess you could call it an organ called a spicule to uh, make sure to uh, guide the sperm into the female's genital pore to enhance um, the embryonation. Okay, um, so nematode infections of humans can be divided into two groups. If the infective stage is the egg and if the infective stage is the larvae. Okay, so for, for the infective stage being the egg, we're going to see a scarus and we're going to see in inter, 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 sorry, interobious. Um, I don't know why I'm getting stuck on that. So interobious um, 
you ingest the egg and the scarus, you ingest the egg. And then we'll see the life cycles for those and we'll talk about those diseases. And for Nicator, we're going to see that it's the larvae. Um, that's the infectious stage. And there's one more that for some reason didn't make it into this list, but we're also going to see a whipworm. Um, so go ahead and add the whipworm um, to this list. Um, so starting with a little uh, introduction. So intestinal roundworms are actually the most common of all of the worm infections, all of the parasitic worms. Um, the roundworms are the most common cause of chronic infections. So these uh, roundworms have uh, adapted really well to living within the host and they typically are good at um, avoiding symptoms of disease so they can continue to just live with the host. Um, there's estimated two billion infections worldwide. So very, very uh, common. Most people do not know that they have these worms um, unless a problem arises or uh, occasionally the worm, the entire adult worm can be shed in feces, um, which then of course the person would see that and and it'll scare them and <laughs> I can't even imagine having that happen. Um, but that's how most people find out that they're infected um, unless they're one of the rare individuals where complications arise. And so we'll talk about that. Um, most of the complications and harm that we'll see will be in children. Children can become, um, you know, malnourished, and suffer a lot of um, side effects of, of malnourishment. And for the hookworms, they can also become anemic um, as well. Okay, so Ascaris will be the first one we look at. Then we'll look at the pinworm in Terobius vermic uh, vermicularis. And then we'll look at the hookworm Nicator americanus. And then lastly, we'll look at the whipworm, uh, Trichus trichuria. And, um, and that will conclude the helminths. And then we'll briefly look at a couple of, of things about vectors. Okay, so our first nematode roundworm infection, Ascaris uh, lumbercodes. And this is dioecious, so you have male and female worms. They look different, the male is smaller. Um, so sexual dimorphism means that the male and female worms look different. So dioecious just means you have a separate male and female worm. And then sexual dimorphism means that they also visually look different. They're distinctly different. Okay. And then over here to the right side, you can see the female much larger and the male smaller. And typically, uh, with the male, you will almost always find this little, uh, curled tail, whereas the female could be in any orientation or, you know, it's not, um, nothing distinguishing about that, but the female will be much larger. Um, over 1 billion infections worldwide just from Ascaris. Um, humans are the only host, so just the one host, just humans. You ingest eggs the eggs hatch in the small intestine. Then it uh, burrows, the larvae burrow into the blood vessels, goes to the lungs. Then the larvae will be coughed up, swallowed, returned to the small intestine. So very bizarre. Um, not really sure why it's taking this um, route. It doesn't seem to have any obvious uh, reasons. And um, it'll feed on the semi-digested food that's in the small intestine. And of course, if you have too many of these worms, then you will not be getting enough of the food, especially if you are already living in poverty and food is scarce to begin with. 
this um, enhances the issue with malnourishment. And then um, the eggs will be excreted in feces. And these eggs actually can survive pretty well in the soil um, for long periods of time. So uh, you have the eggs, fertilized eggs, um, excreted in the feces. Sometimes you'll have unfertilized eggs that will be excreted as well, and then they will just die. The infective uh, form is the fertilized egg, okay? And then it's going to um, start to undergo cell division. It's going to turn into an embryo with the larva, okay? Um, and so it has the worm, the larvae worm inside, and that's what you ingest and become infected with in the small intestine, strangely burrows through, it gets to the lungs, you swallow it, and it goes back into the small intestine. It's very bizarre, very weird, typically harmless, um, except for, as I mentioned, um, if it's, if there's too many of them and, and you can become malnourished. Um, nematodes, uh, pinworms. Now we're going to talk about the pinworm. Um, enterobius, this is um, also from uh, ingesting embryonated eggs. So the egg has the worm inside, the larvae worm. Um, you ingest it and um, then the larvae hatch in the small intestine. And then the adult female is going to travel to the anus and release eggs at night. And then the adult worm will go back to the small intestine and it will repeat this night after night for as long as the adult worm lives. Uh, this is mostly in children, it can happen for adults. It's mostly in children, um, perhaps because the children are playing in the um, infected water or soil. And, um, and so they're more likely to become infected. And so this can cause um, itching around the anus and um, and, and there's, because of this very interesting life cycle where the female worm actually goes to the anus during the night and lays her eggs all night long and then returns to the small intestine, we have some diagnostic uh, methods where um, you can do one of two ways. You can look for the adult worm, let the child sleep for a couple hours and then go and inspect the, the anus and, and look for the actual adult worm. And then the other, um, which you would be able to see with your eye, okay? Um, the other option is to, um, as soon as the child wakes up in the morning, uh, like immediately to press some tape um, against against those folds and um, that would collect any eggs that have been deposited from the adult worm. And then you can put that tape underneath a microscope um, and look for the eggs that way. They suggest for, for getting the eggs on the tape that if you don't find any the first time you repeat it for two more um, times until you do um, so if you do this three days in a row and you don't detect any eggs, then you can assume that the infection is gone. Um, but if you uh, detect eggs on the first time, obviously you don't have to keep doing it. Um, this, this can occur in the United States. It does. It does occur in the United States. Okay. Um, so again, remember the larvae is the worm uh, inside the egg. Um, so when you're pressing the tape and looking for the eggs, uh, those eggs contain larvae. So um, I don't think, uh, yeah, I did. I, the, the, um, those eggs with the larvae 
are what are the infectious stage, right? So um, what's not said here is that uh, this can be uh, the child scratches, you know, the itchy area and then touches toys and can spread it to other children that way. Um, it can also, um, you know, in the feces, uh, if that contaminates water or if the child um, goes swimming, right? Um, those eggs can get released into the water and then be ingested that way. So there's a lot of different ways in which other children can become infected. Uh, but regardless of the specifics, the embryonated egg with the, the larvae inside, right, um, is has to be ingested in order for the child to become infected. Um, this sometimes will have um, lakes, like little, little lakes um, will be closed temporarily off and on because of outbreaks of this. Um, so something to keep in mind. Um, that is it for uh, the pinworm. Now Nicator, a hookworm. Um, this is where we see more serious, um, it's where we start to see some of the serious consequences of these infections. So the adult hookworm lives in the intestine of the human and the eggs are excreted in the feces, the larvae hatch in the soil. They can continue to live in the soil for a while and feed on bacteria and then they mature into the worm, the larvae uh, worm called a filiform. And then that will penetrate the skin of the person. Um, and then they will enter into either the blood or lymphatic um, system, travel to the lungs, cough up in the sputum, swallow, and then make its way into the intestine. Okay. And this, uh, you can have itching or rash where the parasite uh, entered the skin. But typically, uh, people will have uh, no symptoms. But if a heavy infection occurs, such as with children, uh, a heavy infection can occur in children or adults. Um, you can have abdominal pain, diarrhea, loss of appetite, weight loss, fatigue, and um, anemia, which is very dangerous. Um, and for children, right, they're trying to undergo rapid growth and development. Um, not having enough food, not having enough iron, not having, um, you know, enough protein, uh, all of that can have devastating physical and cognitive um, effects on the children. So either repeated or sustained infections can uh, lead to severe iron deficiencies, protein deficiencies, and that can lead to what we call retardation of both physical growth, so height, um, for example, um, and, and mental development can be um, hindered as well. So that's um, very sad. And, and this is quite common in countries with poor sanitation, right? Um, now, uh, one prevention method would be to have shoes and avoid uh, walking in, in areas that could have contaminated soil. Um, nematode, whipworm, okay, this is our last worm infection. Okay, so here you have the eggs are not embryonated, they're passed in the stool and they have to live in the soil 15 to 30 days to become embryonated. And then the person ingests those eggs and they can hatch. So if you ingest the unembryonated egg, you're not going to become infected. But if you ingest the embryonated egg, then the eggs will hatch in the small intestine, the larvae matures in the large intestine. And then, um, about 60 to 70 days after this infection, the female starts to shed enormous amounts of eggs, three to 20,000 eggs every day. And the adult can live with the human for about a year 
and shed that many eggs every day for a year. Um, same uh, or similar concerns, people with heavy uh, infections can have uh, symptoms. And the symptoms for this can be a frequent and painful passage of stool that could be bloody, could have uh, mucus and blood, and it can be a little watery, which would be um, diarrhea. Um, so it can, yeah, it can cause dysentery, right? Um, mucus and blood in the stool. Um, rectal prolapse, where the, uh, the last region of the intestine kind of slips through the, um, the rectum, okay? Uh, it's not considered dangerous, but of course it's, it's not desired and it can be um, treated uh, if you have access to healthcare. Heavy infection in children can lead to that anemia um, and growth retardation that we saw uh, and impaired cognitive development. So same consequence for children that we saw with the uh, previous infection. So the hookworm and the whipworm are especially dangerous for children and very, very common in areas with poor sanitation, okay? Um, I didn't have a lot of check your understanding questions uh, prepared for you. So once you study these diseases, um, we, can re we can look through the book for good practice questions um, during office hours. Okay, so last little bit about arthropods and then you're done forever, okay. Arthropods are common ways to transmit diseases, as you know from all the diseases in this class that you've learned about. Um, remember that these are in the kingdom Animalia. Most of them will be in the phylum Arthropoda, which will be your lice, your fleas, your uh, mosquitoes. These are insects. So all of these lice, fleas, and mosquitoes are going to have six legs, they are insects. They have a hard outer shell called an exoskeleton and their legs are jointed. Uh, this is in contrast to the arachnids, which have eight legs. These are your mites, your ticks, and your spiders. But spiders really almost never are transmitting disease. Um, but spiders are what we think of when we think of arachnids, right? So I put that there to help with that association. But remember that spiders, as, as scared of them as we tend to be, are usually um, harmless. Um, it's the mites and the ticks you got to watch out for that can really spread uh, bad diseases. Okay. Um, this spread could be purely mechanical where they're just, uh, they've walked somewhere with the disease it's now on their feet or their body hair, or some surface of their body. And then when they walk on you, um, then now it's that uh, pathogen is on you, okay? And in that case, the vector itself is not actually infected. This is in comparison to biological transmission, which is what we've seen with like mosquitoes that are infected. And when they take a blood meal, then they infect the host. Um, Right, so that's biological transmission. So the, the microbe is actually multiplying in the vector, the vector is infected, and then it, you know, usually is some type of a bite uh, that will then infect you, okay? Whether it's a mosquito or the tsetse fly, right? Um, the kissing bug, okay? Um, vectors as the definitive host means that the sexual reproduction of that microbe occurs in the vector. So the vector can only be the definitive host if, by, if we're talking about biological transmission, but it is not always the definitive host, um, but it could be, right? So if the microbe's sexual reproduction takes place in the vector, it's the definitive host, okay? And that is the end.
Okay, check your understanding questions for vectors. What are the three types of vectors? Well, we just saw it here, mechanical, biological, um, and de definitive host, okay? Um, try to think back for uh, diseases that are transmitted by uh, the different examples, right? So uh, tick, what's a lice born? What's a flea born? What's a mosquito born disease? What's a mite and a tick born disease um, that you learned about? Uh, if you see an arthropod on your arm, how would you know if it's a tick or a flea? And um, remember that insects have six legs so a flea would have six legs, a tick would have eight legs, right? Arach it's an arachnid, okay? But both uh, classes, insects and arachnids are arthropods. So they all have the exoskeleton and the jointed legs. All right, guys, that's the end. Congratulations on making it to the end of microbiology. I hope you've enjoyed learning about all of these diseases, all of these environmental um, aspects, uh, all these different um, ways to work with microbes, control their growth, um, and all these technologies that are developing. Um, it's been really nice to work with you. You guys have done a great job uh, every week doing all of your uh, lab work assignments, coming to office hours and tutoring. Um, I hope you feel proud of, of the hard work you've done in our class. Uh, you can email me at my EVC email uh, anytime. So Canvas, after the, our class um, shell ends after um, a couple weeks after finals, I believe, um, you won't be able to email me through Canvas anymore, but you can always email me through the EVC email. So write this down or put it in your phone or something. Okay. I wish you the best in your future career and your academic endeavors. Let me know how you're doing. What jobs do you get or what um, programs do you get into? And, um, you know, tell me about them. Teach me what these different, um, all these different paths are like so I can continue to help my future students and also just be able to keep in touch with you. I wish you the best. Okay, bye.